Hey guys, thanks for tuning into my channel. Welcome to episode two of the Creepy South. Hopefully this series will pick up and I'll try and do more episodes in the future faster. But thanks for keep sticking with me and please subscribe to this channel. And you know, Twitter's, I mean not Twitter, what am I saying? <laughs> And then I was about to say Facebook. YouTube's doing this weird thing where they they make you subscribe, but then if you want updates, you have to specifically select that you want updates for all video I, videos that I upload. You know, YouTube's doing some weird stuff. I'm tired of it, but please, if you could go through those motions, I'd really appreciate it. Otherwise, you might not even know that I've posted a new video. Here we go. Let's get started with episode two of The Creepy South. A young couple moved to Aiken, South Carolina in the mid-2000s, excited to raise their family in a small town, whose charm has been the subject of travel and history books. Aiken is a destination town. Wealthy New Englanders travel or retire there to escape the harsh New York winters, or board their horses at many, one of the many stables that cater to, wealthy, to the wealthy horse circuit. This collision of worlds forms a mix of North and South, a town as eclectic as its occupants. Legend has it that a president once kept his mistress here, and the contrast between the opulent wealth of the horse community and the poverty of its less fortunate citizens becomes obvious as soon as you leave the historic district and travel in any direction along one of the area's many country roads. So when the husband landed a job in Aiken, the pair of them couldn't have been happier, especially when they realized they could afford a large house in the town's wealthy historic district. One thing the couple never bargained for, however, the town has a third class of citizen the ghosts and spirits of dead northerners and southerners alike, not yet ready to pass out of this world. And as luck would have it, the dream home they purchased turned out to belong to one of these entities, who didn't seem inclined to give up its space. I spoke with the family several years after the incidents occurred that I'm about to describe, and can testify to several observations. For incidents experienced by multiple family members, each described the events in virtually the same way. Their stories are consistent. And whatever happened to them, each family member truly believes what they told me, and I found no evidence of lying or subterfuge. The mother and father, and each of the three little children, tell of having been visited by a spirit during all hours, day and night. To this day, two of the children, now teenagers, still sneak into their parents' bedroom out of fear. They sleep on the floor. In order to keep their anonymity, we'll call these people the Smiths. The Smiths allowed me to take pictures of the interior of their home, but because they don't want anyone to know their identity, they refused to allow outside pictures to be taken and insisted that I mix the real pictures of the home's interior with miscellaneous ones. The house seemed like the perfect place to raise three small children. It was in the historic district and so close to the town's parks and the famous Hitchcock Woods that the family could walk to them, and close enough to amenities in the local swimming pool, a necessity during the area's sweltering summer heat and it had just been renovated. There was almost 4,000 square feet for five people, enough room for an office, a workshop for hobbies, and even a guest room in the event that people came to visit. Like any young couple, the Smiths had high hope for their future, and after moving in, everything seemed normal, and as though they couldn't ask for anything more. But it wasn't long before things took a turn for the weird. One day, Mrs. Smith was at home in the basement with her three children while her husband worked. While the kids played, she loaded the laundry machine and had just shut the dryer when she heard the sound of the front door open upstairs, followed by her husband's footsteps on the wood floor overhead. The children, all under ten at the time, shouted excitedly. It was still morning, and nobody had expected Dad to come home early, so the group ran upstairs to greet him. But nothing was there. The front door was closed just as Mrs. Smith had left it, and a search of the house turned up nothing. When she called her husband at work, he answered, Mr. Smith had been there all morning and hadn't been home at all. A few weeks later, it was Mr. Smith's turn. His workshop was also in the basement and he was cutting wood as part of a home improvement project when overhead on the wood floors he heard the sound of footsteps. His wife had left earlier with the children, so he assumed that they had come home early, maybe because one of them forgot something or had to use the bathroom. But when he went upstairs to check, the house seemed empty. Alarmed by the prospect of an intruder, Mr. Smith searched the house top to bottom, checking every closet and under all the beds. There was nothing. At this point, Mr. and Mrs. Smith started seeing shadows throughout the house, but only out of the corner of their eye. It never happened in the direct line of sight. Mr. Smith described it like seeing a flash of black at the edge of his vision, as if something was darting across an open doorway, or ducking behind furniture, so fast that when he turned to look, it was gone. He became so concerned that he installed a motion-activated infrared camera in the basement that would turn on and record any time something moved into its field of view. Unfortunately, it didn't work. At no time did the infrared camera record any of the movement that the couple swore they saw out of the corner of their eye. 
By now, the couple began asking about the house. Soon they learned that the house was once the property of a local church that used, that used it to house the pastor and his family. Whenever one pastor left, another would arrive and move his family in. But something happened with the last pastor. Several people they asked told a story about how the pastor and his family had left for vacation, leaving one of the church volunteers, an old lady, to come every day and water their plants. Tragedy struck. One day the old woman walked down the long wooden floored hallway upstairs, opened the door to the basement so she could descend the stairs and water the plants when she slipped. The woman fell to her death and nobody knows how long she lay there before her body was discovered. And by now the footsteps had turned into something more frightening to the Smiths. One day they were awoken by their weather radios which squealed the life indicating that a tornado had touched down somewhere in the immediate area. They woke the kids and rushed them into the basement. While the others hunkered down, Mr. Smith stayed upstairs to watch the news and get a sense for exactly where the tornado was headed, when the DVD player next to the television turned on spontaneously. It had not been programmed to turn on at any time. Mr. Smith turned off the DVD player. At the exact same time, he heard the sound of one of his children's toys turn on from the bathroom on the other side of the house. When he went to investigate, he found a toy ambulance in the bathroom, its lights flashing and siren blaring. But when Mr. Smith tried to turn it off, it wouldn't go off. Then he opened the batteries to take them out, and when he finally got the battery door open, he saw that there were no batteries. At that same moment, the ambulance turned itself off. There is no way that that ambulance should have been able to turn itself on or off, given that it had no source of power whatsoever. When Mr. Smith recounted the events to his family the next day, they all became terrified, but that was the last event that the couple can recall, and to both Mr. and Mrs. Smith, it seems as if it was a lifetime ago. But why did the event stop suddenly after the event with the ambulance? When I asked the Smiths this, they described that prior to moving into the house, neither had been churchgoers. But after the episode with the toy ambulance, the children began attending a Christian school, and Mr. Smith began attending church regularly. It was as if these two simple actions stopped the haunting. Neither of the two know why it happened or if it will ever begin again, but to this day neither enjoys being in the basement alone, and every time the dog raises its head to stare at something, the hair on the back of their necks goes up. This has been the Creepy South. Thanks for tuning in. End transmission. Hey y'all, thanks for watching. Look, now that YouTube is censoring everybody, we all need to work together. So please, click the thumbs up on this video, subscribe to my channel, and do one small thing for me. Share this on social media. Share it on Twitter, Facebook, I don't care which. Everything, every social media thing you're subscribed to, however little you're willing to do, however much. Also consider buying my books. I'm an award-winning author, and you get what you pay for. You'll at least have some enjoyment out of them. I'm not asking for charity. Take a look at my books. All the links are below. Thanks for watching.